Good evening, and thank you for joining us in the series of events as the British Council continues to host online events in the lead up to COP26. The United Kingdom will host the 26th United Nations Climate Change Conference of the Parties, COP26, in Glasgow, Scotland, from 1st to 12th November 2021. The summit will bring together over 30,000 delegates from around the world, including heads of states, climate experts and campaigners, to agree coordinated action to address climate change. At the British Council, we believe that placing young people at the heart of dialogue and action is key to tackling climate change. They are the key resource for us to invest in, to support a sustainable future as they are the next generation of leaders to take on this vast challenge. To support COP26 ambitions, the British Council is working with partners to provide a platform for global climate cooperation, dialogue and action. <clears throat> the British Council's Climate Connection Program brings, brings people from around the world together to meet the challenges of climate change. Drawing on our global network, the Climate Connection Program connects 200 million people from different countries, generations and backgrounds, young people and policymakers, artists and scientists, business and community leaders, and many others. In particular, it focuses on the next generation of climate leaders and gives practical support to young people and communities most impacted by climate change helping them share their perspectives globally and achieve real change. This week's series of programs focuses on waste management and the role of human beings in the waste cycle and the social and economic benefits of an effective and efficient system to address waste. This evening, we have three change makers who have taken very innovative and sustainable solutions to waste and its management. <clears throat> They will each make short presentations, and then we will have them all on screen for a short panel discussion, which we hope you will join in with your questions and comments via the chat. Our first guest is social entrepreneur Hasanka Padukka, CEO of Vibhava Solutions Private Limited, co-founder of Turu and Zero Trash. Hasanka graduated from the Raja, Raja Rata University of Sri Lanka with a BSc Honours Degree in Business Management and he has been a key figure in spearheading Turu and developing the mobile app towards its current status. He is a gold award holder of the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award and was also selected for the prestigious United States International Visitor Leadership Program 2018 under the environment category for his continuous environmental leadership in Sri Lanka as the co-founder of Turu. As the co-founder of Zero Trash LK, he has sought a solution to the plastic problem. Hasanka, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and welcome to the British Council. We look forward to hearing about Zero Trash and maybe a little bit about Thuru also, in particular today. All yours. I know you have a presentation. Thank you, Nandi. So let me uh, share my slides. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege uh, uh, to talk to all of you uh, uh, today with, the, with my colleagues, Sarinder and, and Mudita. Uh, so let me run through you on what is waste. Waste, it's like uh, the secondary or the final output uh, of primary use or any Defeat, uh, defects or any byproduct uh, which has a very low economical value uh, that is waste. We do have multiple of classifications, domestic waste to industrial waste to hazardous waste, degradable waste, non-degradable waste. But what most important matter is like what will happen to this waste after uh, our consumption, after generation. So how do we treat them? How do we manage this? This is the the, the 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 dark side of waste. Like when it comes to Sri Lanka, part <coughs> in this world, like more or less, uh, animal species are being uh, 
directly impacted with this uh, waste, plastic, and other sort of things. In terms of uh, waste become issue, uh, not only for animals and other stuff, even for humans, now it's becoming a great threat. All the waterways and ocean, the more the nanoparticles, more the microparticle comes in, so it creates more issues. So we need to find solutions. What do we do with waste? We, some do upcycling, some create value additions, some do incineration, that is the final solution, and most of importantly, some do reuse this uh, waste, and, and then finally, some do recycling. You create something else from waste, that is an, an, an add value. So Sri Lanka, we have a couple of companies who get involved and, and do certain value additions to waste. So recyclers also play a major role in terms of running a circular economy thing. So how do we tackle this issue? This is not just an issue in, in, in terms of Sri Lankan context. This is not a Colombo issue. This is a global issue. So more or less, every part in the world, they believe on the simplest three words, starting with our pre r concept. Reuse, reduce, and recycling. We need to take proactive actions and also reactive actions to tackle this global issue. We need to see how good we prevent stuff, we do minimization and refuse and then recycling. And then if you can't do anything, then energy convert these waste into energy sources or else a responsibility dispose these things. So this is the consciousness we need to build in young people to tackle this issue. We need to find solutions. That solution might be business viable, might not be business viable, but however, we need to work with organizations, corporates, especially domestic, uh, like individuals to like the general public societies. And it has to be backed by data. So we, when we have data, we can take decisions. Government has to set a framework in terms of managing this waste issue. And also, it's not just talking, it's about actions. How many like effort you put into uh, the table or you put into action is the really uh, matters a lot at the end. And, and when it comes to actions, like how many amount of waste are being recovered from the environment and, and make sure that runs through a circular economy system. When it comes to waste management, we, so we have plus and minus. Sometimes waste, as I said, it's a low like economical benefit thing. So how do we break even these things? That's what, as young people, you need to think, thought of. How first, before make profits, you need to think of how good, if we are doing an initiative related waste, how do you self-sustain it? How do you manage at least to break even it? At, just, at least to cover up the office ex expenses. And then, how do we collect these waste? That's one of the key things. What is the collection source? Whether I go to household and collect, whether I collect from my bin at office, whether do I collect at high school bin, we need to figure it out the way, how do we collect, whether we collect it from beach. That's one of the key elements because waste is there. Enough, tons of waste is there in the spreaded in the environment. But how do you collect all this? That's the biggest challenge we have. And then how do we create value? Value creation is the secret recipe to like uh, su be success in this domain. And so running the circular economy is another key initiative, a key thing in terms of waste management. So ju I just shared about the global perspective and things, how things work. So this is about my personal experience where I started being a waste collector back in 2019 after leaving my corporate job. I think my story will somehow will light your uh, like, uh, like passion or your commitment towards nature to do something new. Because we always find inspirational stories from other countries, but we do find very less inspiration in Sri Lanka. You have to, because we have to do it, we have to went, go to the extra mile to become an inspirational. So I just studied uh, with, along with my team, how does this waste, we can tackle this waste issue. We saw the generation, we saw the value creation, 
but there's a gap so gap is people do not collect that amount of waste and sometimes some waste do not have that validation uh, options so we wear the hat of these recyclable items collector and then now i after two years of homework now we are in the process of building collaborative efforts uh, connecting dots uh, to scale up the project as zero trash we are more or less focused on proactive and reactive measures in terms of reactive measures uh, drop off i have set up an, a collection center at borlesco moor colombo so where anyone come and freely drop off their recyclable trash and we do serve bin collection as a service to corporates and brands and then uh, people who can bear a collection cost we go to their house uh, resident uh, and then collect plastic or another sort of stuff and we have a bin collection system uh, people who have their consciousness we, we we do certain behavior changes we work with them we have a volunteer network and we do run awareness program because awareness is a key element in this waste management so what are the things I, I do collect? Because when it comes to plastic, it, it, it means seven types, basically. There are multiple types, but majority, like principally, there are seven types of plastics. When it comes, it, it goes as, it goes uh, like in the bottom of every bottle or a container, there's a recycler mark uh, uh, and, and, and there's a particular number. So the number starts with from one to seven. So the first one is pet. That more or less the water, mineral water bottles and beverage water bottles, it's uh, PET. Uh, and then uh, HDP, high density polyethylene, which is like a bit stronger in terms of character. Uh, more or less uh, tubs uh, and certain bottles are made out of HDP. And then PVC, certain tubes and, and other sort of wire components are made out of PVC which is also a recyclable material. And then LDP. LDP means more or less people, we know shopping bags and polythene bags. Majority of the bags component is LDP. And then PP, the lids, uh, lids uh, certain uh, components of uh, plastic containers are made out of PP, uh, which goes number five. And the P is polystyrene, we call rigiform. And then the HIP is the, the, the the yogurt cup also uh, very particularly related to this material and then there are types of plastic which are not easily recyclable and so they be called other plastic materials so i do accept uh, pet hdp pvc a certain amount of ldp and pp more or less beer cans to tins and, and the three types of glass. So we do collect and we do sort those things and transport those into recyclables. I have developed a platform called Zero Trash Turkey after two years of work. So we are individuals and corporates then uh, record their monthly wise uh, collection and, and, and we do go and collect those things. So data is pretty much in terms of tackling the issue, in terms of generation and leakage. This is how I started back in 2006. I converted my backyard even without any shape to collect plastic. Uh, I, I based at Moratuva. Uh, I really want to start this thing. So uh, even without knowing the length and the depth or width of the waste management, I just started collection. So I was collecting plastic and it was, uh, it was making losses. But gradually we did the numbers and now we really want to go on a journey where we will sustain collection and we have a business in terms of electric waste management. I have worked with uh, many more people and many more people have backed me in terms of this. It's not a completely individual uh, effort, but it's a collective effort. So after two years, uh, that uh, humble beginnings, now we have a collection center which can cater 10 tons of plastic operations per month. And, and, and it's pretty much of, uh, operational and, and we, we get the traction people come from different uh, areas in colombo and coming and drop off plastic and we do serve certain brands and corporates uh, and then also work with brands so it's it's working so then we, we move the needle now for the last two years as individual uh, as a team as a private limited as a clean tech startup we managed to bring, collect thirty thousand kgs of uh, 
HDP to glass to uh, other sort of recycled materials to a bootstrap method. We didn't wait until an investment comes in uh, because if we wait until for an investment, then we can't go forward. So we started. We started with our efforts. Now it's 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 scale. It's in the scaling mode. So uh, now I asked to talk about Thuru. So back in 2016, we we again came with an initiative called Thuru uh, to accelerate the reforestations. We came with an app, and now after almost five to four to five years. We are just a small ecosystem. We have volunteers and we have an up and running online store covering Colombo and Dampa. Uh, we do have a, something called 100% degradable seed, uh, 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 like a gift item, which calls seed pod, uh, uh, like a sling tech technology, which has a very low carbon technology, uh, carbon footprint. And so we did a small change in Sri Lankan weddings. We converted the normal tanking card into an a, a, a seed container. So 30,000 about 30,000 seed pods were distributed in Sri Lanka for the last one and one to one and a half years. And we do involving regeneration uh, projects, and we 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 are we are working with different youth movements in in South Asian regions. You can't do things alone. You have to collaborate with people, and you have to have a team. So with along with him in there, I do all these things. Our, we have a company called Vibava, focusing on uh, SDG number 13, 14, 15, uh, more or less about climate change and the environment. We build self-sustaining business solutions to uh, to heal the world, use technology to uh, uh, scale up, and then we work with partners. So uh, I have final message for you. I, I take just just take a normal yogurt cup. So once you're having a yogurt, the meal, uh, what you do is like you just simply throw it off. And then uh, what happens is like it will harden, the stern is hardened, and the contamination happens. And then after a few days or a few weeks, perhaps months or years, it will go in. Suppose it goes to recycler. They have to use more energy, more effort, more water, right, uh, to clean, cleanse this yogurt cup. Else, what happened would be what sooner you have the yogurt, what you have done is like use small bit of a milliliter of water and just wash it off. So this is that much simple. And the other one would be you see the shiny beaches in Sri Lanka. More or less, we do have a green cover, but now uh, the because of the deforestation and other sort of development and humanitarian activities, we are losing the the, the, the green cover. So we need to plant trees and, and we need to conserve the existing forest cover and the green cover. And in terms of beach, so more or less, there, there are predictions like that beaches, the, the sea will be overlaid by more plastic components. So uh, our beaches will not be look alike unless we collect plastic and put it into the right process. So you guys, the young people have the power. What you really want to see is like, just to think on what 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 sort of waste is generated in your house and what is happening after what is what is happening after the consumption where do you put all this how many kgs what sort of what types and then what what is going on if you have that mindset you will make sure that your plastic waste and other recycled waste is going to the right uh, location for recycling or uh, uh, energy creations. So you have that capacity. So tie up your passion and tie up your disciplines to do that. Thank you, Nadi. Thank you, Hasankar. Thank you also for sharing your personal story because I, I'm sure it will inspire uh, whoever uh, the, our young people who are listening today. Um, thank you so much. I have so many questions I want to ask you, but I will introduce Mudita and then we will take up the questions in the chat. My next guest is economist Mudita Khatwavala, coordinator of the Pearl Protectors, who is an alumnus of the University of Texas at Arlington and who holds a master's in economics from the University of Colombo. 
Mudita focuses primarily on ocean-based resource economies and blue, blue economies. He's a past coordinator of V-Force, UNV, and Embark Volunteer Platforms, and an ambassador of the Inland Ocean Coalition. Mudita, welcome to the British Council. It is such a pleasure to meet you. And I'm sure you and your team have had your hands full of nerdles, because I think you're, you're still talking about what you know, was gripping headlines a little while ago. So we are looking forward to your presentation as well and what you will share with us on plastic pollution in the marine um, environment. All yours. Thank you, Mirinani. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. And thanks. Uh, thank you, British Council, for having uh, me here today. It's a really uh, great pleasure to be here. And uh, so uh, what I really want to highlight today is actually how waste is impacting our marine environment. Uh, Sri Lanka is an island. It has a coastline of 1,500 kilometers, and it is surrounded by this beautiful ocean. And so uh, many of our waste, because of the lack of waste management, uh, not just in Sri Lanka, but in the region, a lot of waste is being added to the ocean. And so the Pearl Protectors is a youth-led marine conservation organization uh, where we strive to really bring out solutions, <clears throat> uh, bring in ideas to really how we can tackle the, the problems we face and uh, the problems the ocean is facing uh, through, uh, you know, uh, through conservation basis, uh, conservation methods, and also through implementing uh, uh, sustainable solutions. So here, when it comes to waste, uh, all of you probably you know, uh, Sri Lanka has a lot of single-use plastic waste that is being gushed out. So uh, most of this uh, waste ends up in the ocean. So this is what I really want to highlight today. And my presentation today is going to be highlighting about the main, the key uh, uh, types of waste that we really find in our shoreline. And so mind you, when I talk about uh, plastic. I mean, uh, this is not the only challenge our oceans are facing. Uh, to, to start off with uh, climate change, uh, then we, we see uh, problems through maritime services. We are seeing problems through overfishing. We are through, seeing problems through uh, chemical waste going gushing out onto our ocean, <clears throat> as well as uh, single-use plastic waste and other waste. Uh, likewise, there's a lot of issues, a lot of challenges, but here, Today, I want to specifically target on single-use plastic. <clears throat> so Sri Lanka, uh, the western coast, probably most of you are from right now, uh, the seabed is polluted. 80% of the seabed is covered in plastic. There's, there's pollution. 50% of the sea around Sri Lanka is considered polluted. Sri Lanka was ranked uh, one of the top 10 countries in the world a few years ago as to be gushing out a lot of pollution, a lot of waste into our ocean. Apart from that, by 2050, we are expected to be, uh, the uh, our oceans are gonna be uh, carrying more plastic uh, by weight than fish. So just take a moment to really grasp this, uh, you know, this statistic. I mean, the ocean is known for the, uh, the marine life and the fish, but 2050, it'll be plastic. So with that note, I want to start off my presentation. Uh, okay. Right. So single use plastics, these are a few, I want to start off with a few statistics. And these are staggering statistics. I mean, these are, uh, we are talking about 150 million tons of plastic that is existing right now in the ocean. Just to give you an idea of what a ton is, if you put an elephant's weight, that would be a ton. And put that into 150 million, that is how much of plastic that is there in the ocean right now. And so 4.8 to 12.7 million tons just within a year. And this is going to exponentially increase every year as we pass on. This is a, a breakdown of uh, waste that we find in the ocean. 18% is, uh, of course, non-plastic waste, but 
49, close to 50% is single-use plastic. And you, of course, you get plastic waste from fishing gear. These are uh, ideally ghost fishing nets or like other discarded uh, fishing gear that is in the ocean right now. Uh, so moving on, I want to really talk about the, the menace, the problem with single-use plastic. Uh, just in 2017, uh, a few years ago, Sri Lanka imported plastic worth 723 million US dollars, right? So this much close to 1 billion US dollars and most of it went into plastic packaging, uh, food packaging, and these are mostly single use plastic. <clears throat> and most of it would end up as waste. Uh, and uh, to give you a statistic, uh, eight, around five to 8% of plastic is recycled in Sri Lanka. So uh, the global average is at about 18%. And so, as you can clearly see, majority of it either ends up in lands, landfills or uh, some of them get incinerated, of course, but most of them would end up in landfills, rivers, canals, and all of them would almost end up in the ocean. So, uh, <clears throat> these are, these are, uh, this is the problem we are facing. And so, you, you, what you're seeing here are some of the pictures uh, from uh, some of our cleanups we have done. Uh, this is from Crow Island uh, a few years ago, and this is a beach. And when you go to a beach, what you need to see is sand at the beach. But this is not what you see, what you saw here today. It's waste, piles, piled up waste, feet of weight, uh, waste, just you know, different types of waste just gushed up on our beaches. Sri Lanka is known to have beautiful beaches. That That is what attracts a lot of people around the world just our beautiful golden beaches. And uh, this is the result. This is gonna be increasing every year. This is gonna be increasing every time. Uh, every time you use single use plastic, this is what, this is the result. This, this is what's gonna happen. So these are some images. This is actually from last year, Mount Lavinia. You may have heard, uh, you may have heard from the news. Uh, Mount Lavinia was seeing unprecedented amounts of plastic waste coming up. And if you zoom into some of these images, what you see is plastic bags. So this is something I want to talk about uh, in a little bit. And likewise, there's, it was just keep, it, it kept on coming up. We cleaned uh, the beach stretch, you turn back and there's more waste coming up. So uh, this is another picture from Crow Island. And so it's quite unfortunate. If you really zoom in, you can see various types of waste, plastic, mostly single use plastic. This is from Modera, and they were playing football on the beaches, and the beach was, uh, of course, polluted. So this is this is the future we would be handing over. This is the future the youngsters would be taking in uh, if we don't really manage our waste, if we don't really reduce our uh, usage of single-use plastic at least. So this is from Vallabhatta. This is again from, uh, this was from Mount Lavinia. So you can see the types of plastic here. And so with that, I want to really highlight the five main types of plastic waste that we find uh, on our beaches. Every time we do a beach cleaning, uh, the Pearl Protectors does a lot of awareness and, and we really advocate for the protection of the ocean. While we do this, we try to promote volunteerism. So right now we have about 1,000 volunteers. Uh, we have an amazing team, a passionate team who really loves the ocean. So this is also an opportunity to really invite you. If you're really uh, uh, ocean passionate, you can always join with uh, the Pearl Protectors. If you have any ideas as solutions, you're always welcome to implement it as a team and we can work together uh, to finding solutions. So here, when we do beach cleanups, we always make sure that we do it in a proper way. On our website, we have these guidelines we have set up on how to do a beach cleanup properly. And so part of that is to really audit what you collect and then not just audit it, but to segregate it and hand it over to the right recyclers or the incinerators on uh, based on the waste. Right. So here, starting off with plastic bags, this is because this is the uh, the biggest pollutant that we find uh, in our beaches. And mind you, uh, what you see in the beaches, if you've ever been to the beach, what you see in the beach is about three to 5% of the pollution that is in the ocean. So 95 to 97% of that pollution, the same type of pollution is in the ocean, either in the seabed or just floating around in the ocean. 
right? So uh, these these bags could be uh, up in the environment for hundreds of years, and they what happens is they break into small particles called microplastic. Uh, five trillion plastic bags are manufactured uh, in the world every year. So five trillion. So every time you go to the supermarket. What you see is what you get is a, a single use plastic bag. You, you simply use it for five minutes and that's the end of it, right? So here, what you're seeing is a turtle uh, who has literally died because of choking uh, a, a single use plastic bag. And so the reason why this happens is because turtles actually mistake uh, plastic bags uh, to be a jellyfish. And so in the, in the ocean, this is what they see. Uh, jelly, just a plastic bag floating around, it looks like a jellyfish and they would obviously consume it that, because that is their uh, main, uh, uh, you know, uh, food. And so end of the day, they would, they can't digest it and they would show and they would ideally uh, uh, die in the ocean. So it's really quite sad in that that is just an example. All marine animals have, there is research showing, showing that uh, all marine animals have plastic uh, inside their bodies, either as microplastic or as large chunks. Second of, of course, I want to highlight pet bottles, PET, uh, and of course lids. Pet bottle and lids are not the same type of plastic, so just keep that in mind. Moving on, this is a picture from, uh, from the Pacific Ocean. There are islands in the uh, Pacific Ocean and this bird is called albatross. And so what happens is their parents would fly around, they would uh, pick these floating plastic mistakenly because they, they would think this is actual uh, food. And one thing you can notice here is that the, all these plastic items are colorful. And so they would just come and bring it and feed it to this uh, albatross chick and they are literally killing their little babies unknowingly. So there are islands, you can search on YouTube and see these islands just everywhere, uh, these chicks, with uh, dead chicks everywhere. So it's, it's really sad, you know, this is just an example. This dolphin, what you see here is, it has obviously died, but what you're seeing is the reason for the death, a simple small piece of plastic, the ring of the plastic bottle had got stuck in between the teeth and that killed this dolphin. So it's even the smallest particles of uh, pieces of plastic can really harm the marine environment. And so these are some pictures that you see uh, the, uh, the the lids uh, that are all over the all over the beaches and uh, and then with that I want to really move on to uh, the food wrappers. Uh, just to highlight some alternatives for the plastic bag, which I spoke a little while ago, you always have a lot of alternatives. You can always get like you know uh, the reusable bags uh, the the there's plenty of reusable bags. Every time you go to a supermarket, any of our supermarkets would have these reusable bags. It's just a matter of being conscious of uh, once you use it, put it in the car. Uh, every time you go shopping, you just use it instead of, so simply saying no to single use plastic bags and going into uh, reusable bags is the best alternative, uh, best change you can do. And even the bottles, uh, you know, there are always aluminum bottles. There is always, uh, 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 you know, stainless steel bottles, there's glass bottles. Uh, there are all types of bottles which are always reusable. So try to move away from single use plastic to pet um, uh, bottles to reusable bottles. And also keep in mind, pet bottles should not be used reused because uh, PET is resin number one. Uh, that does not mean it's, it's a resin code, uh, but uh, PET, if you keep reusing it, you're obviously gonna get uh, it's it's going to be harmful to your health. So uh, with that in mind, I want to talk about the third one, which is uh, food wrappers and packaging. And these are some pictures that you see on our beaches uh, every day when we do cleanups. These are these are what it is. 20 million lunch sheets. Lunch sheets are also uh, used in Sri Lanka, and 20 million are 20 million is used every day. So uh, and these these. Uh, uh, plastic would break into smaller particles called microplastic again. And you can see the, the delicious chips on the bottom right hand side, it's broken on the top. So what has happened there is it's broken into smaller pieces and it's probably still in the sea. So moving on, these are some more pictures. Uh, 
And so this image was actually taken at, uh, at Mount Lavinia. So what this fisherman actually said was that, you know, uh, when they bring on the bring out the nets uh, in the morning, uh, they would bring dustbins to collect the trash. So this is a comparison of trash versus fish they collect. And so even the fish, there was a, a, a person there who just opened the, the gill of the fish and there were little particles of plastic inside those gills. So this is what we are doing, not just to the marine environment, but indirectly, uh, we are impacting our own health uh, by these single-use plastic. So uh, this is why we really need to move away from these sorts of single-use plastic items. And then, of course, I want to talk about sachets. So the sachets are mostly found in Africa in, and in Asia, Southeast Asia and South Asia. This is, this is because most of the, uh, uh, there's a lot of household uh, which is in low income. And so for a low income uh, household, sachets are considered the best option. And this is actually false because you see the thing is, uh, when you consider economies of scale, uh, a low income family would not be making a, a saving, uh, collecting or like, you know, buying sachets because end of the day, by buying a large portion, you would make, uh, you would save more compared to buying sachets on a daily basis. So we, we conducted, uh, these are some pictures which we found on the beaches. And so it's it's really unfortunate because these types of waste is made out of this resin code number seven. Now seven is mix of different plastic and these cannot be recycled. And so at, it's even, uh, the worst is you cannot even collect these types of plastic. It's, it's very difficult. And so you may have seen these pictures uh, on, on uh, you know, when you go to a grocery shop. But after April 1st of this year, this has reduced. That is because the government has uh, enacted a, a, a legislation, a, a policy where uh, any sachets, non-consumable non sachets, less than 20 milliliters or 20 grams is banned, right? So many of these sachets that you find here were out of the market, uh, but still, we advocate for 50 milliliters or 50 grams because uh, what happened was some of the companies actually misused this and they started like you know producing 21 milliliters, 22 milliliters just to be on the uh, just to be above the 20 milliliter or 20 gram. So which is quite unethical to do because end of the day these all these cannot be recycled. Every time you use it, uh, you just have to throw it away. And because it's not recyclable and it's very hard to collect, they would usually end up in the ocean. So um, if you've ever been to the beach, you definitely would have seen sachets just lying across the, the beaches. So this is a survey we did of different types of sachets uh, in Sri Lanka. And so, uh, uh, and, and this is the result, like, you know, these are the top five manufacturers in Sri Lanka when it comes to sachets. And so, uh, and, and, and this really highlights that, you know, we really need to move away from sachets as a consumer, we need to stop using sachets. Uh, best thing is to buy in bulk or in a larger quantity. Uh, so finally, I want to stress straws. Straws are actually, you know, it's un unnecessary. Uh, you know, these, these are something that every time you go to a restaurant, every time you go dine, you, whenever you order a drink, they would just throw in a straw and give it to you. And simply by sipping, the cup you can drink the same drink so the straw is very unnecessary as alternatives there's always the metal straws the glass straws there's paper straws these are actually more sustainable than these straws because once you use them you cannot clean them you cannot reuse them uh, it's very difficult to recycle them because there's food particles in them so uh, you know most of it would end up um, in our beaches in our ocean or in landfills so um, just a few things that i think would really help uh, to keep in mind. And these straws would be in the environment for 200 years if left uh, untouched. And so, and they would even break into little particles called microplastic. So these are a few pictures uh, from the beaches. Uh, you obviously may have seen these sorts of similar pictures from uh, the beaches. And, uh, and then with that, I want to get into the next type of waste that we are seeing right now. This is quite new. It's very unfortunate this happened. May 20th, the MV Express Pearl disaster took place. And so with that, there's all kinds of waste that were released to the ocean, different types of chemicals. 
uh, there is still oil being uh, leaking out from this ship. Uh, there was smoke, uh, toxic smoke that went out from the ship. And but worst of all, we are seeing nurdles, billions and billions of nurdles that have slipped out and is now polluting our beaches. So this is one of this is a new type of waste to Sri Lanka. We've never seen these nurdles washing up on our beaches. Everybody was curious. Everybody was like, you know, uh, they were excited at some point, like because this is something that you've never seen. But the harm these nurdles can bring to our environment, to our coastline, is far detrimental. Uh, first of all, these nurdles are the building blocks of any single-use plastic item, and they are very, very small. It's considered a microplastic, and so what happens is initially they are white, but with time they would turn, they would start discoloring, right? So for the marine environment, marine animals, they would mistake them to be food, right? So they always float in the sea, and they would just go and consume them. And what happens is they would end up, you know, uh, filling up their gills. They would fill up their guts, inside guts, and if we are to consume these sorts of things, especially with the, the chemicals that were there, uh, that's going to be quite harmful for us. And these nurdles act as sponge for chemicals, different types of chemicals, so they absorb any chemicals that are in the ocean or in the beaches. So with that, uh, it makes it even more uh, uh, toxic, and also it's very, very, very difficult to collect. So this is why we started the Nurdle Sri Lanka campaign, where we want to remove these nurdles, promote volunteerism while we uh, remove these nurdles from our beaches. So we've developed different sieving tools and we've been very successful with uh, doing these uh, uh, cleanups. Uh, obviously with COVID we had restrictions, but we've started it again. So if you're around uh, this Sunday when we are planning on doing a cleanup, we might do it in motor tour. Uh, so you can always follow our social media to see where we'll be doing it. You can always join us and help us remove these nurdles from our beaches. So this is what happens with nurdles. Uh, these are small particles. They are very hard to collect. You need special tools to collect them. But with time, it makes it so much difficult to collect it from the beaches because they, they, they discolor. So these are some samples we've collected from the beaches. And you can see how uh, discolored they are right now. Uh, and then finally, I want to, I think, I've gone a little beyond the time I had. But finally, I want to touch base on the transboundary marine litter. This is something transboundary marine litter means these types of marine, uh, these types of uh, litter floats around in the ocean. It might not be from the same country, but it might have been from a different country that floated through the ocean currents to another country. So that adds to the waste in another country. So we are right now doing a, uh, doing research and surveying these things. And so these are some sample pictures. And you can see the countries they are from. Uh, uh, we, have, we had bottles from Dubai, Tamil Nadu, India, with Germany, we had bottles. We had from China. There's a lot from China coming in, from Maldives. We are seeing, like, you know, even further going, we, have, we saw from Malaysia. We are seeing from uh, Vietnam. Uh, almost all countries around the Indian Ocean, but surprisingly, Nordic countries, even the United States, we've seen plastic bottles coming up on our shorelines. So this is a, 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 a type of waste that you may have not been aware of, and we want to create awareness on this thing. So um, this is, I, I just want to take a minute maybe to uh, just really uh, phrase it, because a lot of people have this misconception. If you turn the pet bottle upside down, you will see number one. That does not mean that is only used for one uh, one time. Uh, it means it's the type of resin code. In Sri Lanka, it is now mandatory that all plastic items need to show this space, uh, this resin code. If not, it is not supposed to be in the market. So that's actually really good because it helps the recyclers, recyclers to really understand what where these plastic goes in. So number one, two, uh, sorry, number one is pet. Plastic bottles are mostly from this. HDPE, you get like, you know, much uh, harder bottles. Uh, uh, and then, of course, PVC. PVC is not single use plastic. Uh, you get PVC pipes and they can be used for longer time. Then LDPE, lunch sheets and such, is usually made from LDPE. And PPE is uh, plastic lids, yogurt cups, and all that uh, uh, you, get, you get out of PPE. And uh, Polystyrene is where you get like, you know, uh, a little bit harder plastic material, like, you know, plastic cups and all that is actually made from this. There's one more, number seven, which I may have referred to before as well. Sashes are made out of number seven. Seven is a mix of different plastics. 
you cannot recycle them at all. So uh, if whenever you go to the market, whenever you next time you see plastic, try to see, try to understand these resin codes and also try to reduce the amount of single use plastic you use. So with that, I want to end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mudita. So much to be aware of and so much we can do also. I'm looking forward to catching up with you uh, when we do the chat and I'll have um, some more questions for you. I'm also going to remind our audience that their questions and comments are welcome. So please put those in the chat. And finally, we have Sarinda Unambua, CEO MD of MAS Creda and a member of the MAS Apparel Board. Sarinda is a committed conservationist a champion of environmental sustainability and sits on MAS's Sustainability Steering Committee, a committed change agent and a key driving force behind the Work From Anywhere initiative at MAS. He is a strong advocate of flexible work policies that help to empower women in leadership roles. Sarinda has walked the length of Sri Lanka twice and ridden a bicycle around Sri Lanka four times to raise funds for two, two separate charities he co-founded, Trail and Wheel for Wheels. He is a published wildlife photographer and is passionate about physical fitness. He believes a healthy, active body is key to a healthy, creative mind. Sarinda, welcome to the British Council. It is such a pleasure to host you. And I'm looking forward to what you're going to share with us today. Thanks, Milali. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you for uh, to the British Council for having me on this program. Um, I have a brief presentation that I would like to share with you and uh, and uh, speak about. Um, so, as Minali said, I represent uh, the apparel sector in Sri Lanka, and if you look at the apparel sector globally, it is considered the second most polluting industry in the world. So that was a bit of a shocker for me. Uh, because coming completely from outside to suddenly see the damage that we were doing to the environment was quite scary. Uh, but what I'm really fortunate to uh, be a part of is an organization that is very committed to trying to make a change and trying to change and, and uh, make a net positive impact to planet. So what we started doing was we started really looking at the damage that we are, um, we are impacting on the planet and all our surroundings. And we started just focusing on a few areas. So the first thing that we did was we were looking at our fabrics and accessories that we uh, use in the manufacturing process. Of course, at the same time, simultaneously, we were looking at chemicals, we were looking at water, we were looking at electricity and all the other areas as well. But for today's discussion, I'm just going to focus on this area. Um, and we started seeing whether we could reduce, repurpose or recycle the fabric that we're using. So when we talk about the fabric usage in uh, apparel, we are not talking about simply what's made into a shirt or uh, you know a pair of pants or anything like that. We are looking at also the tremendous amount of waste that is generated from cutting these patterns out to create the garments. That waste amounts to tons per month. And that's just from a company like MAS, a group like MAS. So if you look at around Sri Lanka, you're talking of tens of thousands of tons of fabric waste that goes into landfill. Now, this is almost as bad as plastic. So these go into land. I was looking at the first for the, those images that Hasanka had, and I was thinking how much we would have contributed over the years to those mountains of garbage all over the, uh, the country. But I'm happy to say now that we are zero landfill. And uh, Safra, can you go to the next slide? Safra is driving for me today. Um, so we, we, we took a lot of, we made a lot of effort in creating some initiatives to start addressing this issue. So first, uh, I'm not going to rattle off everything that is here, but I'm just going to kind of twist this discussion towards a little bit of what Mudita was talking about, and also what Hasanka was talking about, because a lot of this uh, is stuff that if we really look at how we can reduce or uh, repurpose or recycle, that we can start making a massive impact on. So, Looking at these areas again, I'm just going to focus on one particular aspect that is very relevant to the two previous uh, presentations, and that is the recycling, the, the plastic side of it. So if we may go to the next slide. 
Okay, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. So what we started doing, there were, as I said, there were many initiatives we were looking at. But this one was an interesting start. We were doing a charity walk. A few of us were doing a charity walk in Sri Lanka. And then we, we, you know, we started seeing all the plastic on the side of the road. And at the same time, one day we, during that walk, we ended up on beach one day. And the whole beach was covered with plastic as well. And you saw some of the images that Mudita was talking about. So we thought to ourselves, you know, this is something that we need to start getting involved in. And the thing about an organization that, you know, rather than an individual is sometimes if the organization is big enough, the muscle that you can use to really create economies of scale, to have success in, in making these things, it can be faster, but the commitment needs to be there. So we started work look, devising a plan. First, we thought we'll do a study and see how big is this problem? Is it a localized problem? Is it something that is all around the country? And really understand what was happening. So we were looking at plastics on roadsides and then we realized, yes, it was an issue, but it was an issue of scale that could re we could really impact. And having done a few studies, we focused on ocean plastic. And we talk about ocean plastic, Sri Lanka being an island. And if you look at where we are situated, Mudita was talking about the kind of waste that washes up on our show. You'd be amazed at how much of the waste that washes up on our show is generated outside Sri Lanka. So there is a lot of stuff that's coming from Bangladesh, India, Thailand, even Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, those are that, that side of it. And then on this side, again, India gifting us for plastic from both sides uh, comes on the, on the West Coast as well. And as far as some of the African nations, plastic has been washing up. So when we did our study, as Mudita was talking about earlier, we found plastic from all these different areas washing up on our shores. Now, there's very little that we can do to prevent that plastic washing up on our shores um, in, in Sri Lanka. So we started focusing on what we could do within Sri Lanka. And I will get to that on the next slide, but let me just focus on what we found on the beaches and what we planned on doing with that. So then we started looking at, okay, if we start collecting these bottles, especially the plastic, the pet bottles, if we start collecting those, the rest, that was the one that was the most difficult to dispose of. The other stuff you could incinerate, you could get rid of, you know, uh, it was perishable or you could, uh, it was easier to dispose of. The plastic was the biggest problem that we were facing. So we started talking uh, to a few people and then we came uh, upon this company called EcoSpindle that they were already doing conversion of plastic into a fiber that they were making brushes out of. And then they told us of a plan that they were planning on making yarn out of uh, pet bottles. So we thought that would be a perfect combination of what we were trying to do. So we spoke with them. They said they will take up eight bottles. Then we spoke to the Sri Lankan Navy. We partnered with the Sri Lankan Navy and started collection centers around the country. And what we have been doing for, uh, for quite a while now is collecting, as you can see the statistics here, um, we have been collecting plastic bottles primarily, ocean plastic, and sending it to Eco Spindles where they are then, they go through a process and they are segregated. And that then it generates a fiber, which is converted into a yarn. And that yarn is converted into a fabric, which is then made into product. Now, the last Sri Lanka T20 jerseys um, were made with this uh, recycled yarn. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, uh, these ones, uh, that, that this season coming up or the tournament coming up over the next few days also, I believe, is made of the same material and I'm hoping it will bring better luck than it did the last time. But what, what we're trying to showcase here is what is possible. And if you look at now, this is a linear linear model. So it goes into this, uh, this phase and then it, it's created into a garment and then we don't take responsibility after that. But we'll get to that a little later as to what we're planning on doing there. So we started making these, uh, this fabric and now what we have found is we're actually running out of uh, plastic to convert into yarn because the yarn has to, the plastic has to be of a particular level of purification. It can't be, um, you know, multiple colors and all. Uh, there is difficulty in converting those. So, if you think of all the plastic that is collected in bottle form and then condensed to make a, a fabric, what you have to realize is when you look at a bottle, if you crush it into solid form, it will come down to a cube about this size. So because most of it is there, what you're seeing is there, even a big pet bottle is there. So it's this, when it's crushed and made into a pellet, 
to then convert into yarn, it reduces. The, so even 21 million bottles that we have collected doesn't make a huge amount of yarn. And it doesn't quite solve the problem of, uh, of PET either. So what we were trying to do, so PET is a different issue that we have to now figure out what we are trying, what, how we can either find a substitute or something like that. I'm just going through uh, processes that we put in place to try and reduce the impact to planet. The next slide, please, Safra. So this is something that was really interesting because when we started thinking about the plastic that was getting washed up, as I said earlier, a lot of it was gifted to us by our foreign uh, brothers and sisters. But at the same time, there was a lot of plastic internally that was getting washed through our canal systems and the river systems on, into our, onto our beaches. Because what happens is the current takes it out, then it spins out and then comes and washes up on the shore a few kilometers, sometimes five, six kilometers away. So for example, when we were uh, looking at Kalpitiya Beach, a lot of the Columbo's garbage had been brought out at Mutwal, washed out into sea and then brought back onto Kalpitiya uh, Beach. So this, then we tried to figure out, okay, what if we can create some kind of blockage to prevent this going into the ocean? That's when we came up with this ocean strainer. And as you can see, we can collect about 30 to 50 kilograms per day from just the, uh, the one canal that it is, from one canal that is, uh, that we have, that's the average that we have seen. Now, what we're trying to do is try and put these in all the canals around. I believe we have done about two or three canals right now. All the canals around Sri Lanka and even the rivers. Now, the problem with some of these things is because of the boat traffic, we have to figure out how we're going to manage, you know, raising and lowering and all that stuff. But that's in the process right now. Also, what we did is when we when we created these or when we made these, um, we open open the invitation to people to partner us. So anybody who wants to buy these, they can they can have the technology. They can either make it themselves. We will share that technology with them. It's not really that complicated. But at the same time, if they want to buy it from the people who make it for us, we provide that service as well so as of now there have been interest uh, there has been interest from uh, people as far as fiji and thailand and many other many other countries to use this so uh, mudita hopefully this will contribute towards stopping inland plastic going down the waterways and washing up on the shores but again folks we have to realize that unless we as consumers stop using single use plastic start really being conscious of how we dispose of whatever we have to use but is beyond our control of stopping but what we have to use if we don't do that ourselves then we lose the right to complain we can't walk onto a beach and say gee this is filthy because at the end of the day we are contributing to that as well so the responsibility here while corporates can do stuff is within us as well we have to be responsible as well and next slide please so finally, what we are coming to is the circular economy. What we are trying to do now, and this is still in early stages, but the technology is available. We are working towards creating apparel that can then be used, worn through its life cycle, and then recollected, either repurposed, or there is a process now that can shred, the, the say, the shirt. It can be completely shredded. The yarn can be then extruded, it can be taken out, almost deconstructed and reconstructed in a, in a usable yarn to be woven back into a shirt or a trouser or pant or a piece of a barrel. So it creates that closed loop. Now, if we can crack that, that reduces not just, we talk about just the waste that goes into manufacturing. But if you think about it, even cotton, for example, cotton is people are clearing acres of forest to grow cotton because it's an economic, economic, of economic benefit. There's massive amounts of water that gets used for making a single shirt or a single pair of pants. Um, so the damage done to the environment by the apparel sector can significantly reduce if we can go to the circular economy. But having said that, the only way this can be successful is some of the big brands back this and really support this recycling uh, program and create the collection centers, especially in the Americas and in Europe. Because as we know, in, in our part of the world, most of us will wear a shirt and then we'll hand it down to somebody else and hand it down to somebody else. Eventually, it'll end up as a duster and a car wash cloth and it'll, it'll be dissipated into uh, multiple tiny little shreds. But 
in in the western world it, it's mainly it's worn for a season or two seasons and then they chuck it and they have buy something else the whole fast fashion industry has created monstrous amounts of damage so if the same people the same brands that created fast fashion can create the circularity create the environment where people can bring their used clothes back chuck them in a bin maybe get a discount for it whatever but if those clothes can be recollected to go back into the into this circle then i think we're going to make a massive impact so there are solutions available right now but the biggest solution or the biggest way that we can contribute as individuals is don't buy too much i know that's kind of contradictory for somebody whose uh, job depends on uh, apparel being manufactured but don't buy too much you buy what you need to and recycle repurpose and i have to admit that some of the clothes i wear if you see them in dark gray or dark blue they were originally white and they have then been turned into light green or light blue and then they have been dyed into dark green or dark blue so i i do that i i recolor them and i reuse them as much as possible those are the little contributions that i like to try and make uh, in my personal life but if you all start to make those contributions if you are all conscious of the impact of the planet that we each one create then the problem becomes a lot less the the photographs of uh, that mudita shared of the of the dolphin and the albatross and i have seen those photographs before and it breaks my heart and that is created by us we have done that we have to take responsibility for that so till we stop allowing consumer goods that we use to result in that we can't point fingers so that's it for my presentation and i really i look forward to having a chat with you and um, and having some questions and answers great thank you sarinda and thank you also for creating that wonderful little opening for me to bring in my little pet favorite uh, topic of uh, around waste management thank you so much actually for what you said because it's a lot it's it's good to hear it from somebody of of your stature also for young people because it will inspire them when you say buy less that's such a crucial thing actually especially at this time but um he stole my thunder and he talked about circularity but i really want to i really want to i really want that notion out there i want people to start thinking like this so i mean it has been around for quite a while and it has been around in connection to waste management because the linear approach to consumption this produce use discourse that that clearly is not working anymore for for us or for the environment or for the economy so i think for a, for a viable change i think we have to start thinking differently so mudita and hasan so we already heard what sarinda has said but sarinda please feel free to add but i mean what are your thoughts on this and how can we help individuals and companies other companies who may not see the value in this see the value of it so if i may can if, I, if, if yeah. i may if i may take lead here uh, yes. the one thing miral is there are there are several aspects of uh, of circularity for, for example circularity can be done in a very small scale okay and i believe that you know while big corporates and the big brands can do large scale global impact circularity if it isn't complemented and supplemented by small scale you know industry starting up and people like uh, hasanka and mudita the contributions that they make on a not i wouldn't call it small but certainly uh, a smaller scale than some of the mega brands in the world that would be able to do uh um, it is really critically important that individuals like this are encouraged supported and given all the uh, the momentum possible to be able to take these out throughout the community because if getting community involvement here uh, you know we are talking about collecting uh, not just pet bottles but even sachets and plastic bags and all this stuff if we can create mini economies around these collection centers uh mini economies around the waste uh and encourage people to convert this waste into i don't know there are things that can be done you can make ornaments you can make flower pots you can make bricks you can make all kinds of stuff with waste so even in small scale if we can encourage people to do it that is where the secret lies while the big big organizations will be able to make a bigger impact there still be a huge void unless you know small to medium scale doesn't kick in no i think uh, that's actually a really interesting point uh, of view uh, 
just to add to that, I think uh, uh, personally, I believe uh, one thing that really needs to happen is the demand for such uh, uh, unnecessary uh, items, you know, single-use yeah. plastic, is quite unnecessary. Twenty years ago, thirty years ago, this was not a case. Like you know, we had our traditional ways of like you know uh, consumption, and but the thing is now it has really drastically changed into something else where literally you use something just to be thrown out, and so that is a uh, it's a it's a it's a to fix this, you need conscious decisions. You need you need to start from school. You need to really uh, inspire a person to really why why to uh, not go with the trends, but rather to uh, think consciously, think sustainably, think you know proactively uh, to really reduce the amounts of unnecessary uh, 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 consumption that could lead to waste. And so, if you if you actually do that, the demand for such items could actually be dropped. And so. I understand it's a little bit of a different opinion, uh, uh, but uh, but what this could do is this could really bring in the quality of items uh, in the long run, and so that can have a much more better impact uh, socially, economically, as well as environmental, rather than going into uh, looking at you know quantity which is just filling our oceans and our landfills. So that's my opinion on it. Right, uh from my end, what I see is like the, the terminology we use, it's waste, either trash. So then from that onwards, it, it means it's useless. So when it comes to running in a circular economy thing, we need to define this as a resource because we humans extract more primary resources and do value creation. So now we need to uh, like make it more secular uh, and think on in terms of designing process, how good this is, how this is re compatible in terms of recycling, uh, uh, in terms of reusing, and how du uh, durable is it, and then how minimalizing in terms of resource requirement. So likewise, uh, then it goes into consumption, uh, production to consumption, and then the disposal and again the collection goes in so we need to create that momentum so as as and uh, mentioned we need to start that uh, uh, awareness among the the rest of the 21 million people it's just not uh, one or two people do that and practice not the corporate it's about the consumers so con the brands and the producers Need needs to design certain things, uh, make it more compatible to run that product, particular product in the circular economy module. And the consumers, the end users, we need to collect those things. Unless we collect or sort or send that thing to the right location, we, we will never ever run the circular economy. So, that's a, that's a challenge. Okay, but to help this whole effort, and all three of you spoke about these pet bottles. So, I mean, every household, I think, uh, I, I can't imagine there's a household that a pet bottle doesn't come into. So, okay, now the, now we know about Eco Spindle using pet bottles to make a yarn. So, in what condition, what type of pet bottles? I mean, if we publicize these things, Sarinda, and say, we, this is who we are, this is what we're using it for, and especially if you tie to this Sri Lanka cricket team t shirt. I mean, I'm sure that young people will just rally behind something like that because, I mean, there's such a sense of pride. So, I mean, if, if you if you and Mudita and Hasanka can actually get that message out saying what kind, and as you said, Hasanka, clean them, maybe rinse them out take them to a particular place if you can't take them to a particular place i'm sure that you know down in every area you can connect create some collection center or work with the local government authorities or something but what what are the pet bottles that we need to be doing that with and what are what are the ways that we should be actually addressing this pet bottle trash so i think these collection centers are uh, valuable and they are extremely important because um in the collection centers if they are if they are all around now say for example when you come off the highway every highway exists as a collection uh box likewise most of the supermarkets i know kiels is doing a great job with this they are collecting a lot of plastic in their outside their supermarkets and also recently they have done a really 
great job where they have taken recycled uh, uh, plastic and they are paving some of their uh, roadways within South Asia gateway terminals. Uh, so that is a that is uh, that is brilliant use. But again, you know, I go back to what Mut says where we had to stop the we had to reduce the usage. You know, yeah. taking after the damage is done. Uh, taking it and then trying to create something is one aspect of it, but we had to reduce that. We had to try and have more longevity in whatever we are using for uh, for consumer um, bottling, packaging, whatever it may be. Uh, but that collection center thing is very important because some of the ocean plastic is deteriorated to such an extent that you can't use it. It's 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 just rubbish. You can't do anything. In terms of pet, yeah. In terms of pet, it's uh, we we like more or less the beverage bottles, the mineral water bottles. More or less, it's pet. And then, and as as Mudita also said, when you make it upside down, you will see the mark E1. That means uh, we call it a pet bottle. So when it comes to pet bottle, so there are different uh, color codes. Initially, there were multiple color codes, right? Uh, now uh, the standards are there. Uh, like green uh, and the brown color and then the plain one. Initially, it was, there was blue or okay. gay. And, and when it comes to pit, what you really need to do is like remove the liquid inside and then either remove the label and then uh, squeeze it. And then as, as uh, so when it comes to pit, you need 30 bottles, to, to uh, at least 30 to 35 bottles to make for one uh kg of it you will get only 30 to 35 rupees maximum 40 to 45 rupees uh from the recycler so zero that you the low low economic benefits uh just for the one kg but when it comes to numbers there are multiple and like million, millions of bottles in the economy so we need to collect all these things and then uh, now, when it comes to Sri Lankan context, now as uh, Sarinda clearly mentioned, and I'm really uh, uh, inspired in terms of the thought processes and put that into the right actions. Where even I supply bottles for eco spinners. Now they do a yarn and then they do this apparel thing, and it goes not only in local context; it goes beyond Sri Lanka. It makes certain foreign incomes for Sri Lanka, and it creates more opportunity. So. Particularly for the pet, the threat, the problem, now we have a solution. I don't say it is a 100% solution, but more or less 75 to 80% now we have a solid solution. Uh, we, we, whatever the things left over in the environment or the collection centers or household, the post painters collect and they do washing, they do the crushing part and then do the cleansing part and then they do the yarn, uh, it goes through the process, the yarn produced, and then uh, companies like MAs and other uh, international brands, they do purchase the yarn and do the so that. That's the circular economy. So we have that thing into pet. So I think pet might be needed, required in terms of, uh, this is a, again a contradictory thing, sometimes in terms of export, sometimes in terms of food, uh, uh security like uh, compliance sort of things uh, uh, and in terms of low economic benefits like in terms of packaging cost sometimes pet might be the viable model to run these things uh, and, and in terms of the gram weight the thickness the size of the lid so we need to reduce these control these and make compatible to do recycling. So that's one of the way in terms of basis of circular economy, we can use this problem into a solution, convert the problem into a solution. Yeah, I think what Asanka said was really important. Like when we do cleanups, we see like pet bottles, which are like 200 milliliters. That's like the single use of single use. Like it's it's just seeping like a, like a, like a gulp of drink and you just throw it out. I mean, uh, it's ridiculous like how, how companies are just bringing down the volume of these bottles. Uh, I mean, it makes it so much more difficult to collect them. It's, it's just adding to the waste. So I think, I think here the government should also intervene here and like set boundaries, set caps to uh, what types of, uh, what, what is the bottom cap for what, uh, you know, single use, uh, the, the pet bottles. Uh, it's very important that we do it, but 
just uh, just the thought i mean it's different from everything that everybody has said but just everybody making uh, eco bricks is something also pretty cool you know uh, you know having a having a bottle like this about 1.5 liter bottle you can add about two months of plastic waste into this right so uh, once you have like a lot of these bottles it's like a eco brick you know you can make a lot of different items at household level so if if anybody can do something try to reduce the waste that is going out from your house these are with simple things yeah. okay. absolutely you can also use it as a weapon <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> but i also want to talk about this that you know that a point of reference now when i was growing up as a child when i went to the beach i hardly saw any any, yeah. any kind of pollution i mean i think when sarinda was when we were growing up we had the most is we would see broken glass i mean that was like the, and it was such a bad yeah. thing to find broken glass you know but now children go to the beach and i'm sure they just see loads of trash and it's like nothing you know so the point of reference now ha has changed so as as the trash increases it's just going to get less and less i mean the, if they see like a square inch of sand maybe 10 years down the line they'll think that's a beach so going back to the single use plastic i mean what can we do because nobody is going to overnight change their relationship to single use plastic mobita so does it help that we reuse the single use plastic then no At no, no. single help, the definition of single use plastic single is use? what it is like you should never reuse it because the material the composition of these plastics are made in such a way that it, they can only be used once and if you keep on using them that's going to be har harmful to your health and uh, that could have a uh, far detrimental repercussion on you so that is that is a big no uh, if anybody is doing that they should really stop it i've seen like in even schools they bring their like pet bottles like they keep them keep using them you know continuously and even I'm, i'm i'm guilty of that when i was small also i didn't know about it but i kept on using and there's a lot of people you're doing it so that's not the solution i think the best solution here is to really uh, up for the alternatives switch to the alternatives it's it's a, it's a difficult task at, at, in the beginning it's uh, you know right now we are we live in a society where this is the normal you know see there's all kind of single use plastic even if you look around your place if you're looking around your desk there could be items of single use plastic so this is this is something that you have to consciously see uh, you should identify what is single use and what could be the possible alternative so once you identify it becomes natural you know so it it takes time so when we do school programs also we make sure that we go back to the school and we you know follow up with them and it's amazing what kids say kids have gone back to their homes and they've been inspired their parents to switch away from single use plastic that is what needs to happen so giving that reason uh, you know when these kids grow up when they when they're having kids one day you wouldn't want like you said a beach without sand those images that you saw earlier that is going to be the future if we just go on on the same trends we are going right now so right now is the best time to really make this change i think not just individuals companies corporates and also the government also needs to work together to really make the change here and what kind of shocks me is the big fncg companies that don't really take responsibility once they sell the product they have to you know uh, rather than do just little eye wash uh, plastic collection um, exercises they have to come up with some kind of solution um, because they are the ones who are doing the biggest damage to the planet and then they talk all green after that so we we need to start really putting pressure on them as well uh, but the sad thing also is mudda uh, and hasanka and minali of course uh, is that you know what i what i see on the beach sometime and if you go to the beach is acceptance the moment we start to accept that's a slippery yeah. slope yeah yeah that's a very slippery a slope because yeah. the sad thing is you know i have this habit of picking up garbage it's become like almost a joke in office also they make fun of me and you know show me walking and bending down and picking stuff but now when you see masks and all that stuff even the current situation you can't pick that stuff up so you tend to walk over it um the moment we start walking over garbage whether it's on the road or on the beach or on the river side or wherever or national parks when you're driving through and you see a plastic bottle on the side of the road the moment we stop doing that is is a really, really slippery slope it means that we have accepted the situation and we're just ignoring it yeah asanka do you want to add to this uh, it's, it's about uh, 
we have that mindset once we consume any sort of plastic we really want to throw it off from our vehicle or anywhere from our yard or our house or just, just throw it off so that doesn't mean that it will end up from uh, from a point b point it just goes and end up at land below the water base what we really want is like now we just said we do awareness and in terms of uh, starting the that build processes in terms of how to uh, stop this this disaster and to make other people what we really want is like in terms of tackling the single use plastic or like inculcate this as a must in, in, in every children's life. So like they need to have a reusable glass bottle or whatever, uh, uh, like a little bottle or something. So if, if wherever they go, they have to carry that thing. In terms of uh, like, a, like a food container, it like might be made out of metal, might be made out of uh, uh, HDP or anything, just to have that thing. See, and then whenever they shop, they must carry at least, uh, like I think, maybe the touch that point, the, the alternatives, there are plenty of alternatives. So that has to uh, like embedded in the lifestyle, just not on social media. It's an activity on embedded on all the households in Sri Lanka across different demographics, different incomes, and different practices. Unless we do that thing, but this will never happen. And then we, as Sarinda said, the corporates. The corporates have that capacity to, the capability, the strategy to sell any product in deep in rural areas in Sri Lanka. But they don't have that capacity to recollect that thing. So that's what we really want to think of. So Mudita and team just go and collect, collect, collect and raise awareness plan about this. And we also from our capacity, this needs to end somewhere else. Otherwise, we, 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 we run initiatives, but we never ever manage to solve these things. So we want every young person to talk to their parents and then come up with a very small plan. Okay, we generate plastic, what are those plastic and where do we go and put this? They might be in a bin, you know, on a uh, highway expressway, or it be on a nearest supermarket bin, or even both are the, 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 the collector, the picker, or whoever, or even the butter lorry, the small lorry going here and there, just collecting. So we need to build this informal and formal collection mechanism. People need to have that liberty to properly and responsibly give and drop off their plastic. Unless you, uh, the local council has to have a proper plan. Government has to have a framework. What needs to be, what can be done, what can't be done. The youth engagements and the movements, the NGOs to corporates and everyone to play their bit. Unless, uh, with the uh, summation of small, small initiatives, the ecosystem thrives. Unless it's like very difficult to work on a different cell and then, uh, and, 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 tackle this problem. So plastic has good uh, effects and also it has a more negative effect unless you manage it properly. So environmental impact is the critical thing uh, ultimately because we don't have a secondary environment, no secondary place to go and enjoy. So we need to preserve this environment. We need to collect all the plastic and make sure we produce less and we reuse it. That's the way forward. Thank you. I'm very conscious of time and there are no questions from the chat. But if any of you want to say something in closing, I'm not going to ask any more questions because I can go on all night talking about this and I don't think it's fair to anybody. But if you have any closing thoughts before I wrap up, please, please do share. I just like to tell everybody and uh, anybody who is listening is that uh, it's important that every one of us makes at least a tiny effort towards changing habits. Because unless we as consumers change those habits, nothing is going to happen. Nothing will change. It'll be a you know because it'll be a tidal wave of waste that will come our way and it'll swamp everything inside. We have to make the change. <laughs> Mm 
Mudita, uh, I want to add uh, something important here. With the COVID, we are seeing a new type of face pollutant, you know, the fa face masks. So I think, uh, you know, something that everybody can really do is, you know, uh, I wouldn't say reduce face masks, uh, but I would say the best way to de uh, dispose of face masks is to cut the straps. Right, you know, because every time we do surveys, we do beach cleanups. There's like so much of plastic. Uh, these, these, uh, you know, these face masks that are on the beaches, and these are ideally made out of uh, polypropylene, which is really, which is very really hard to recycle, and they can they are considered as waste, uh, medical waste. So, cut the straps, collect your face masks, hand it over to a waste uh, medical waste uh, a disposal center. Don't just throw it around here and there. So that's my um, that is my message. On the masks, before Mudita says anything, I also want to say that you can take out that piece of wire that goes across your nose, and that that you can use that for a million different things. I mean, I, I cut it out and I use it at home, and it's very useful. So one thing. To, sorry, Mudita. Uh, yeah, no, ahead. that that was exactly exactly. There's so many uses also out of it. Uh, so just just don't throw it away. It's just on the roads. It's on the it's on the canals. Like it's it's on the sewers. It's just blocking everything. Once it's in the once it's in the ocean, it breaks into little tiny plastics, microfibers, microplastic. It's in the beaches. Just you know, it's in the corals. It's breaking the corals. There's so much harm that harm that this is creating. So uh, I mean, uh, just be conscious about it. Mudita, sorry, Hasanka. Right. Uh, so um, I think the key message that I'm going to put in is like we, we have seen uh, in overseas, uh, in, in, like in terms of Japan, like there are good practices, right? And we people talk about these things. And uh, but I think Sri Lanka, Sri Lankans, we 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 can do more than that. What lacking is like the discipline. So what we really want is to build that awareness and the discipline. And I think uh, that's it. Parents, parents has to teach their children about waste. They have to educate them, and then, especially uh, the university sector, the school sector, the professionals, and the, especially again the business leaders. I think business leaders they they re really can influence their co like uh, uh, colleagues uh, to take decisions. So I think if we can do that bit. If you, if as a corporate or a household or a school or initiative, we can collect this thing. I think uh, there may be nothing much going to uh, uh, beaches or, or the sea. That has to collect. The collection, we need to focus while, uh, again, I, I emphasize minimizing the things. So when it comes to single use plastic, we need to minimize it. Yeah, and, 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 and then think on the design perspective and, and make sure. The degradable amount, the, the stuff, it can be easily accessible and also economical viable. Otherwise, plastic will be there forever. We need to think on new technology which will be compostable or degradable in 90 days to 120 days. So that tech, we need to invest, focus, study, and do r &D. Otherwise, we don't find solutions for plastic. Thank you all three of you. You have been so patient with my questions and been very engaging and very keen to share and sort of in, inspire people. Thank you so very much. I'm just going to wrap up. So climate change won't end this November and we hope this series of events and programs will be a sustainable legacy to build on. And that the momentum of this year's work and the net networks we have built will provide the right impetus to change. In the lead up to COP26, the British Council Sri Lanka undertook a research study on climate vulnerability with the objective of developing a deeper understanding of the perceptions, attitudes, challenges, and readiness of over a thousand youth nationwide. Look out on our website to register for the Youth Climate Action Virtual Conference on 28th and 29th of October, 2021. This conference will contribute to the dialogue and conversation that would lead to recommendations and ideas for the future, celebrate the success of youth leaders addressing the impacts of climate change, and scrutinize and explore research evidence 
on how young people can effectively contribute to climate action priorities set out by the government of Sri Lanka, the United Kingdom, and COP26. Please do check out some of our other programs we have hosted since World Environment Day in June this year. They are all available on the British Council Sri Lanka Facebook page and YouTube channel. There is also information on collection centers for anyone who is interested within those programs. Thank you to the audience for joining us this evening. Thank you again to Hassan Kamudita and Sarinda for their time and their enthusiasm. Thank you so very much for all the preparation also that went into making this program what it was this evening. We wish them greater success to continue their pursuit of a change for the better and success in all their endeavors. Thank you to Safra and the team. In closing, I'm paraphrasing Werner Feuermann, who said in 2016, we can no longer say that we have inherited the planet from our parents, but that we are borrowing it from our children. Can we say that we will leave behind a planet that is better than it was before? Good night. Thank you. Stay well.